Okay, we are continuing in meeting management today with our discussion of motions and how to handle those, so forth. Before we get completely into that, I would we've kind of been updating uh, parliamentary issues as they come along, and uh, I've had an interesting call come in recently of a group that adopted their bylaws in essence. And this is their first annual meeting coming up. Now, can you see anything wrong off the top of your head with adopting bylaws in essence? Michael? Right. So they have two parliamentarians working on this matter, one on the East Coast who is in email correspondence with me uh, because their convention will be held here in the near future. And so we're trying to figure out uh, whether or not they have the status of an organization yet and, uh, or whether or not they're going to start as a mass meeting when they get here. I'm waiting for the hard copy on those bylaws to arrive. but. Um, <coughs> It's just another instance of one of your normal organizations trying to do what they would do under normal circumstances and the issues gotten confused because some of the people who were in charge apparently uh, did not know what they were doing in the first place. Okay, we've been talking about ranking motions and the need to keep those privileged subsidiary motions in order and how they relate to the uh, main motion that's on the floor. Okay, how many, last time, how many ways, how many kinds of motions can be used in order to get business before the assembly? Okay, we've got all these visual cues up here on the table. May have to move them in a little bit for the home audience. What do we got over here on the bottom? Okay. <coughs> main motion. Okay, we got a main motion over here. What are all these red blocks? We talked about them last time. We'll get a shot of them. Okay, hang on a minute. Okay, let's get a shot of the red ones. I'll move them. Okay, are they on? There we go. Okay, these are called the restoratory motions, and they bring business back before the assembly. And they have the same status that the main motion has. Okay, so we're going to put them over to the side, just kind of as a reminder that any one of those red blocks could be sitting down here where this yellow block is. Discharge a committee, amend something previously adopted, and all of these ranking motions could be stacked up on top of any one of those. But just to keep this part of the matter simpler today. Uh, we're going to let the main motion, uh, so we'll be color coordinated too. Uh, we'll let this yellow main motion uh, sit over here for now. But it could be a resolution. It could be a simple main motion. It could be uh, one of the red restoratory motions. Okay, you've got all these blocks sitting up here. Are these all the same kind of motion? I mean, they obviously have different names, but we talked about classifications as being restoratory over here, main, subsidiary. and what were the other two? Okay, they were subsidiary, and what's the fourth classification? Incidental. Okay, incidental, actually I'm leaving off one the way we're counting. What are these up on top called? Privileged, okay. Uh, how many of these are privileged? Five. Okay, good answer. The top five are privileged. That leaves seven, if I'm counting right, in the middle from postpone indefinitely up to lay on the table. Seven? Right. Okay. I think you're counting wrong. Should be seven. Okay, the main motion, though, you don't count. Main motion is not subsidiary. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then five privileged up on the top. So five privileged, seven subsidiary, one main. And those have to stay in order. And we were looking at those last time. We'll be coming back to them 
again. Okay. Uh, so we've got, we're looking at three groups here, restoratory, well, we're looking at four groups, restoratory, main, subsidiary, privileged, and that leaves incidental motions, okay? There shouldn't be any green blocks showing right now. What we're going to do, we've alluded to a few of those last time, we're going to go, we're going to go through the incidental motions today and make sure that you have the definitions of those straight. Some will be more obvious than others. <clears throat> With an incidental motion, why does the incidental motion, why do I not have any of them over here in this rank order stack? I got a question though. Uh, okay. Are those motions that you have from top to bottom stacked in a specific order? Yes. Okay. They are in the order that they must be in. If, if one comes out, the stack closes up. Well, I'd scratch that. That was not a good uh, reference. So I'm going from a main motion to postponed indefinitely to amend? To okay, refer. wait wait a minute. Yeah, I didn't phrase that well. Okay. As the motions are made, they're made in this order, and this is assuming that all of these were made. This is all the kinds that could be made out of the ranking motions. They're disposed of in reverse order. Fix the time then you'd vote on amend, then you'd vote on recess, then you'd vote on question of privilege, just work your way on down the stack. Now as we did last time, you often don't have all of these made. Sometimes all you have is a main motion with an amendment and then maybe a motion as this table to lay it on the table and then somebody moves to recess and, and that's all that you have pending before the assembly at, any point, at that point in time. And if that's the combination that you have, then you vote on them in the reverse order of which they were made. If anything is sitting out here, you know, if, if we've made all of these motions, or, or we've made, say, we went one, three, five, seven, you know, uh, you can't go back and make something lower in order. You can't move a lower motion when a higher one is pending. They have to stay in order. And we'll be looking at that some more. Let's get a few more definitions. Are there any listed here that you're not sure what the term means? Or is that clear from last time? Okay, Mike? Postponed a certain time. Uh, same thing as postponed definitely. Uh, but when you say postponed a certain time, uh, can a motion, example, can a motion be made to take up the matter, uh, today being October the 26th, Say I want to make sure that I get all my little ducks lined up, or I may want one for or defeat this this proposition. Can I uh, make a motion that says I want to postpone till November seventh? Mm -hmm. So that's and that's what, what this motion is. Okay. And sometimes it even specifies the time. But what you would say is I move to postpone this matter, whatever bill or issue is before us. I move to postpone this matter until February the third at four p.m. And you can even say and make it a special order, which means no matter what we're doing at 4 p.m. on February 3rd, we will stop and this comes before the assembly. Okay, but we'll deal with special orders another day. Uh, but, but that's a really isolated example of postponed to a definite time. Or postponed definitely. You're welcome. Yeah, Wally. Uh, the difference between uh, laying on a table and uh, postponed to a certain time. Okay. Uh, when you when you lay it on the table, you, you do postpone it to a, or essentially postpone it to a certain time. No. Right? no, when you lay it on the table, you just say, "I move to put this over there," and then it stays there until the red restoratory motion take from the table brings it back. So when it's just tabled, that's higher priority, as you can see. Uh, when it's tabled, it there's no specified time to bring it back. It may kill the motion. It, sometimes that motion is abused and it kills the motion because they never bring it, the assembly never brings it back from the table. But it may be that we're talking about something and we need to know how much money's in the bank account before we vote. So someone just says, I move to table this. And then the treasurer comes in 
and you see that the treasurer arrived late, and so then uh, you know a little as soon as there's been a change in parliamentary situation, any something has intervened, then you can say I move to take from the table the matter of purchasing a computer. Michael. Um, given your hypothetical, how did we ever move on to business when we had the treasurer's report? I mean, um, there's got to be something extraordinary to happen there to break the chain, so. No, well, back when we were going through the order of business and I called for treasurer's report and someone said, the treasurer's not here yet, I would say, okay, then we will move next to the report of whoever else has to report because we should have already done the president, the vice president, the secretary, treasurer. We'd probably be ready for standing committees. Just depends. But yeah, there are times that officers arrive late, and when they arrive late, you deal with it. Um, maybe, too, that the treasurer could have been there and has to look something up. You know, maybe the tre treasurer gave uh, the report in the checking account, but we need to know how much interest has accrued in the CDs or whatever. Anyway, for what the point is, for whatever reason that you put something on the table, you can table it for 10 minutes or eternity. But you can bring it back by saying, I move to take it from the table at whatever point you're ready to take it from the table. Sometimes you have uh, people out in another room meeting, or, you know, they're just different reasons for tabling things. Okay, anything else on what the motions mean? Because that's the, the first thing we have to get straight is what do these words mean and then which ones must stay in order and why. And in the course of doing that, you know, we'll eventually sort out whether they're debatable and amendable. Mm -hmm. Postpone indefinitely, does that mean that it... That's no the one that kills it. Okay. Yeah, if we vote affirmatively to postpone indefinitely, it's like postponing it for eternity. It's not used very often. The advantage of it is that it will extend the limits of debate. Will open the, if, you're, if you've been at this for a long time and debate is being exhausted on the main motion, it's a way to open up additional debate without moving to modify debate. Um, it's a more polite way. Maybe you missed your opportunity to object to the consideration of the motion. We were talking about that one last time. An object to consideration can be made, the motion can be seconded, and you can still object to consideration, but once debate has started, then you can't object to the consideration. So maybe you weren't thinking fast enough. Maybe you couldn't get, well, if you couldn't get the one-third plus one to object, you probably can't get the majority uh, to kill it. But anyway, you weren't thinking fast enough to object and debate got started on this motion, but you really don't like it. And so moving to postpone it indefinitely, you may be able to kill it with a majority vote where you didn't have the two-thirds vote required to keep it off the floor in the first place. And maybe there was no valid reason to keep it off the floor. You just don't like it, but it's certainly within the purview of the organization to deal with it. Okay, anything else on the definitions here? Well, if you think of one, come back to it. Okay, we're going to deal with some green blocks today, and these are the incidental motions. Now, what's an incidental motion? Okay? Something incidental to the main motion. It's well, that's a circular nature. definition. Well, something by its very... A point of order could be to bring... If it's an incidental motion, but also a point of order is... Okay, don't tell me what a point of order is. Tell me what it, I want to know what's going to be true of all of these green blocks, of all the incidental motions. What's an incidental motion? Something that would either bolster or defeat the main motion. It's incident. It, mm, not know. necessarily. I give two answers. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, two reasonable guesses. Incidental, <laughs> incidental motions pop up separate from all of this stuff. That's why I've left these sitting up here. Well, you said they're incidental to the business, but an incidental motion is incidental. And if you know what incidental means, then you're okay with that definition. It won't work on the test. Okay. But incidental motions pop up as the situation requires. So this point of order could, have, could occur anywhere along this chain. 
And when an incidental motion occurs, you handle it at the moment it occurs. Somebody might say, you know, point of order, we didn't vote on fix the time. Well, we need to stop right there and take care of it. Or point of order, uh, table is not debatable. Well, we stop right there and take care of it. And point of order, if you haven't figured that out already, points out an error in parliamentary procedure. We let something be, deb you know, debate started on something that's not debatable, or maybe uh, we got a motion out of order. We're already up to limit debate, and somebody moves to amend the main motion, and the chair is about to put that on before the assembly. Point of order, that mo not the member, but that motion is out of order right now because limit debate is the immediately pending motion. So a point of order points out, indicates an error in parliamentary procedure. And any time that occurs, you want to fix it just as fast as you can. Now, about the only exception to dealing with it, uh, if you are in the middle of a vote, if you are taking the vote, affirmative and negative, unless the point of order relates to the voting procedure. Okay, but if, if it was point of order, something, I can't think what, right, would depend on the situation. But anyway, if there's something else going on that we need to know about, uh, then they probably correct it as soon as the vote was completed. Okay, another incidental motion is the appeal. And an appeal is what you do when you don't like a ruling by the chair. Now we set up here uh, number five under question of privilege that um, uh, a question of privilege may be something that affects the whole assembly like can we have the drapes closed in the back of the room, can we uh, you know, get people to stop smoking, whatever it may be. And the chair might say no, uh, the chair is going to rule not to close the drapes in the back of the room because of the lovely view of the woods and waterfall outside and we want our members to be able to appreciate this. To the question of privilege and I appeal your ruling, Chair. Okay, but you don't write, we w we've already had the question of privilege, which was the request to close the drapes. So when I say no, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. Then you would simply say, the wording would be, Madam Chairman, I appeal the decision of the Chair. Now, if anybody else agrees with you, then they say, second. This is a strange little motion, and it's used from time to time. It's strange because it's the only motion that I can think of right now that does not require a majority vote. A tie vote will sustain the opinion of the chair. But on this one, I appeal for the decision of the chair. It's seconded. On this one, we said the other day on debate that normally, unless there are other rules restricting debate, that uh, each person gets to speak twice, no more than 10 minutes each time. On the appeal, the chairman speaks first, explaining why he or she ruled the way that they did. Then members may speak one time only, expressing their opinion either for or against the ruling. And then the chair gets one last response to either, re hang on a minute, to either refute or summarize or whatever. But the chair gets the first and the last. The members get one speech in between, and then it's put to a vote. Question. All right. The burden is always on the appellant. He should be able to open and close. Okay. Well, on your final exam, you can address that issue with the general. Remember, uh, on your exam, you have an opportunity to evaluate motions and how you would change them and so forth. So, the burden, the burden of proof is always on the appellant. It's presumed that the ruling made was proper, absent something extraordinary. Therefore, the appellant opens and closes because the burden is on him. Okay, but if you're under Robert's Rules of Order, that logic doesn't prevail. So, yeah, so the, the rule under Robert is... Uh, Chair speaks first, everybody else gets one speech, chair gets a second crack at explaining why the, what was done was done. Then it's put to a vote, okay? And a tie vote 
sustains the opinion of the chair. Now, can you think of why that might be? Okay? Just like anything else, there's been nothing to, um, there's no majority or consensus that would overrule the chair's opinion if you've got a tie vote. Um, in law, what you have when you have a tie vote on an appeal is that the lower court decision is always affirmed. You're going to need a majority of people to overrule the chair. If it's a tie vote, you're right back where you started from. So why take away the role of the chair or the dignity of the chair by allowing a tie vote to overrule the chair? Okay. And, the, and a, a separate answer, which might be a little shorter, is that the chair is has the right to vote when the vote makes a difference. So the chair, can, under normal circumstances, over here on these motions, normally the chair would be quiet in the interest of impartiality. But if you were really opposed, well, not necessarily opposed, if you have strong feelings about the main motion, then you may vote to create a majority and thus adopt the motion, or the chair may vote in order to create a tie and defeat the motion. Okay, on the appeal, the assumption is if under, among the members we have a tie vote going, the chair, if the chair voted, the chair would vote to sustain his or her own opinion, which would then def or would vote negatively not to sustain the appeal. So if the chair voted, the chair is going to vote for themselves anyway. And so that's just inherent then in the vote required on the motion. Okay, let's look at some more. Uh, this one's easy, open nominations, and uh, I happen to have closed nominations on the back side of resolution. So you can look at that a minute, and then we'll turn the resolution back around and park it over here. But those do just what they say. You know, wh whether we're, normally we're not in the middle of other business when we're conducting an election. But it could be that we have business pending but we have made, uh, Waleed asked earlier about making special orders, postponing definitely. Maybe we had an election scheduled for 9 o'clock this morning, and because of weather conditions, a lot of the people are, didn't make it, and we decided to be nice and postpone the election until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Some groups like each other well enough, they would do something like that. So uh, we have a, a special order for an election to come up. And we've got all this stuff sitting there pending before the assembly, but we're ready now to stop that somewhere in the middle of this process and conduct our election. And it's okay, would be okay under those circumstances to do that. But anyway, motions like I move to open nominations, sometimes those are just assumed by the chair, you know, and we'll get into elections more later on. Just know for today that, that open nominations, closed nominations, those are incidental main motions. They, they have the status of a main motion because uh, there's nothing else on the floor when they're made. They don't have the priority that something like a point of order does. But still, they're incidental to the main business of the organization. Okay, a point of information is a kind of request and it's something that would just pop up. Uh, there, are, there are also, uh, here it is, request, I'm going to put these up together. A parliamentary inquiry is also generally an, a request for information as well. Uh, a parliamentary inquiry might be, you know, parliamentary inquiry, does this motion take a two-thirds vote or a majority vote? Uh, parliamentary inquiry, do our bylaws permit uh, suspending rule number three regarding membership? And the answer to that is probably no, but uh, you know, unless the bylaws say they can be suspended, they can't. We'll get more to that later on too. But anyway, a parliamentary inquiry asks a question about parliamentary procedure. A point of information asks information about anything else. How much money is in the bank? Uh, do we have a copy machine available for the standing committees to use? Can we get more coffee in the room? You know, just whatever it is you want. Now sometimes point of information gets abused 
and is treated, it's used in debate when it shouldn't be. And, and you'll get uh, questions like, uh, you know, point of information, and, th and th these are both motions that can interrupt, like point of order. You know, point of information, is the lady aware that if we adopt this motion, the implications are going to be blah, 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 blah. Well, that's an abuse of the point of information. And the wise presiding officer will only put up with that for a little while. You know, and then you'll direct the member to be concise, to confine such remarks to the discussion period, whatever you need to do. The point of information is designed to be that, not a big, broad, debatable question, but literally the asking of a point of information, a specific whatever. Okay? And, and that's often very legitimate and very useful. Uh, you know, if we adopt this motion, will it have, and sometimes you really, you're not debating, you, you need to know. If we adopt this motion, uh, how many counties in South Texas will be affected? And, and that's a nice information gathering question. You know, it's not one that has that uh, combative uh, debate tone to it and is designed to make the other speaker look like an idiot or whatever. Okay, uh, division of a question. We used an example, oh, I don't know, last class or the one before, about uh, a motion to uh, purchase a computer and a printer. Okay? Or we could have that, to bring back the one from last time, we could have a motion to paint the trash cans and the park benches red and white. We'll skip Longhorn Orange today. Okay, when you have a compound motion like that, it's okay if the whole assembly agrees. You know, if, if you know from uh, prior discussion that people are going to be pretty much in favor of this from your workshop before the real meeting, to quote the mayor. Uh, but anyway, there are times that a motion is made from the floor and it has several parts to it. And maybe you're in favor of painting the park benches, but not in favor of painting the trash cans. Maybe you're in favor of buying a new printer, but you don't think we need a new computer. The problem is just the quality of the print, okay? What you do in order to be able to vote on those parts separately is to request a division of the question. Now, if it's obvious, computer and printer, there's only one way to divide it. Sometimes, if it's a resolution with several whereas clauses, uh, more than one resolution clause, <clears throat> normally the chair would put those to a vote separately to start with. But if for some reason they didn't, he or she did not, then this would be a legitimate use of this motion. You know, to say I request a division of the question. Sometimes, if you're the one presiding, you'll need to ask how is it you would like to have the motion divided? Now, maybe it's not clear to you. Uh, maybe on the painting issue, the question is not on what to paint, but on what colors to paint. And you would like to have the question divided so that we vote first of all on whether or not we even should spend the money to paint them, and then we vote separately on what colors, if we're going to paint them, what colors do we want to use. So that's a handy little motion. It's usually not too controversial. It's made like a request. You know, Madam Chairman, I request a division of the question. Uh, and if it's clear, you go on. Normally the chair would vote it. If the chair, vote it, grant it. Uh, if the chair doesn't grant it, what would you do? If I say, no, I don't think this question is divisible. Rod? Can, can you vote on that? Well, vote. not yet, because I haven't put it to a vote. We've got, uh, somebody said, that the motion on the floor is, I move that, it's been moved and seconded that the trash cans and park benches on the central campus be painted red and white. 
and somebody moved to divide it. And I said, no, I don't think this is a divisible question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to keep it intact. Wally? Actually, Rod, Wally. Rod, I got you backwards. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's no problem. <laughs> um, appeal? Yes, good. Right answer. If I, if I can get the student names right, we'll be in better shape. Um, so it's no problem. <laughs> Actually, they don't. It's just a brain cramp. Yeah, you want to come up here and stand on <laughs> Okay. And they don't even change chairs each time. That's the sad part. That's right. Okay, but the correct answer is and what was and is appeal. And then if the assembly wants the motion divided, they would vote on that and get it separate. Normally, that would not happen. Okay, but division of the question separates the question. Okay, now there's one, if I can find division of the assembly, here it is, that sounds very much like, I'm going to start another stack here, okay, so I can still see over to the folks at home. Okay, division of the assembly is a different motion, even though they sound somewhat similar. Division of the assembly, when would you divide the assembly? Why would you ever want a motion like that? Aren't we supposed to be united and stick together? It's for religious that? purposes. I don't see why you want to do that. No, religion has nothing to do with this. Neither does politics. Okay, this is, what, this is the motion you use if the vote is not clear. Okay, if we've had a voice. All the A's go over there. All the nays come over here. Okay, maybe. Sometimes it's That's not what that. they do sometimes. And what they'll do is then specifically count because if it was by voice vote and there was too much yelling and A's and A's, you couldn't get it. If it was by hand vote and people were moving around, and if it's superbly important to what they're going to do, they're certainly going to move to divide the assembly because they want to make. Sometimes you don't even have to do anything. Just by where you stand is your vote. Right. Yeah. Now, in, in parliamentary debate, the audience moves back and forth across the room. This is your little trivia for the day. Uh, you know, as the speakers speak, if you agree with the opposition speaker, you move to that side of the room. If you agree with the other speaker, you move to the other side. Okay. Normally, you don't have to move the bodies. You have several options ahead of that. But often with a voice vote, the nays have learned to yell louder than the yeses. So you have all in favor, and they go, aye. All opposed, no! And your gut instinct tells you there were a lot more eyes than there were no's, but you can't be sure. In particular, you know, in a group this size, you can usually tell. But if you've got a couple of hundred people in the room, uh, that may get tricky. So if, if this is a group even of 10 or 15, then you may be able to say, well, the chair is uncertain. Uh, all of those, and the chair may divide the assembly, or a member may request it. And sometimes it happens simultaneously from both. Uh, but your next move would be in a small group to say all those in favor, raise your hand. And sometimes you have to say, hold them up high, hold them still, you know, because they're kind of flopping them around out there and they're stretching and doing different things. But anyway, a show of hands would normally come next. Yeah. So a division of assembly, or raising your hands would be a form of division of assembly, just anything that, mm -hmm. that separates the two. Uh, Right. Now, Robert says that you have to have a standing vote, you know, that a division of, and he would have everybody stand up anyway, but uh, common practice says do what's practical, and if you've only got six or eight people in the room, uh, there's no reason to be that formal. And you'll remember back lecture one on parliamentary procedure, we said as the size increases, the formality of the group needs to increase. So you'd probably go to a show of hands next unless you knew with a big assembly that the votes were scattered and it was going to be hard to count them. So then the next level up, as it were, would be to go to a standing vote. All in favor, stand up, be seated, thank you. All opposed, stand up, be seated, thank you. Now if you say thank you to one side, you're supposed to say thank you to the other. If you say please raise your hand to one group, you're supposed to say Please raise your hand to the other group, you know, so it doesn't look like the chair is showing any uh, favoritism in the way the vote is being called for and all.
But anyway, division of the assembly gets a show vote, and uh, if that standing vote is not visually clear, you know, and there's a call for a division of the assembly, then you may need to go to a counted vote. Sometimes, as Michael was saying, you heard them from one side of the room to the other. More likely, uh, you'll appoint some people as tellers and ask them to help count the people. Often it's the secretary and the parliamentarian and the president who are counting and, and they check off. The other thing you can do is get people to number off one, two, three, and they call that out nice and loudly and then it's monitored by the people out there in the crowd. Comment. Actually, that, that came into play once in our group and, and you'd be surprised how important it was because it, it did change the vote. I mean, we tried orally and every time it was yay, they would yell louder, nays would yell louder, we couldn't do that. People were raising two hands, one behind the other, we mm -hmm. couldn't get an accurate count. It was a very passionate thing we were taking up. And finally, the, the chair, who happens to be the speaker at the same time, said, tell you what I'm going to do, divide the assembly. That's all there is to it. If you're four, go on that side. If you're nay, go on that side. And you'd be surprised the remarkable difference when we were able to count out the bodies. Yeah. And if you have a small enough group, you know, I have never, and I've worked with conventions of 10,000, not very often, but occasionally, uh, we've never had to move the bodies from one side of the room to the other. But what you want to do is get a system that works. If you know you're going to have controversial votes to start with, be prepared in whatever way you can. Some groups just start with ballots from the very beginning and they do everything uh, by written ballot. If you've got proxy votes, we've talked about those before, where you're carrying votes from someone else, then you'll need to uh, do some sort of balloting system. But if, you, if you've got a big meeting and you plan ahead, you know, you can get color-coded uh, ballots and you can get them perforated and they'll tear off like similar to ticket stubs and, and you can get all of that ready to go on the front end so that, uh, you know, depending, uh, a pink may be worth one vote and green's worth five votes and yellow's worth uh, ten and a blue one's worth twenty and on down the line and then you just tear on the perforations and drop them in and then you've got a whole team of tellers who are tabulating those uh, while the next issue is being uh, discussed and debated. And if you have office staff, which large groups running big conventions often have, then uh, you can have the paid staff tabulating those and they're watching each other. And you know, if it's really controversial and so forth, then you can have a member of each side of the issue watching them count the, you know, the poll watchers. Uh, you can have someone monitoring the tellers to be sure that everything uh, is legitimate. Okay, here's object to consideration. We've been talking about that one uh, anyway, but object to consideration, as you probably deduced from previous discussions, is what you do when you're opposed to the main motion. Okay, but the main motion or a resolution, is that over here? Okay. Uh, it can be seconded. It cannot be, uh, you ha can't have started debate. Motion, not, not the objection, but the main motion itself. Once you get a second and you begin debate, forget it, objections. Okay, dead. but there's a it. line in between there. You, it can be seconded, but debate cannot have started. I, I thought I heard you say once it's seconded, it's too late. But anyway, if y'all want to check these, I've looked this one up just because we were talking about it a lot last time. On 265 and Robert is where, and you should be reading about all of these anyway, just so you've got a visual uh, reinforcement in there. Um, but anyway, the, most, the main motion can be seconded, but you cannot have started debate on it. And that's where that little thin line is. And sometimes uh, there, you, know, we, you go from the main motion and before you ever get debate started, somebody moves to table it or someone moves to recess. You could get a very complicated scenario out here before the debate ever starts. But nothing else is going to happen until you get the motion seconded. Well, I shouldn't say nothing because I can think of exceptions. 
but anyway, uh, you'll have the main motion, it'll be seconded and stated by the chair. And in that length of time that it takes to do that, any number of things along the way can happen. There may be points of information, there may be parliamentary inquiries, recess, amendment, you know, we tacked all kinds of amendments on these last time. All kinds of things can happen before you ever get around to starting the actual debate or discussion on that main motion. And until that discussion starts, the motion to object to consideration is in order. But the object to consideration only applies to the main motion. It may be made at other points, and it's green because on a green block because it's incidental. Okay. Uh, but you can't object to referring something to committee. You can't object to the motion to recess. You can't object to the motion to adjourn. That would make it hurt. <laughs> well, it just doesn't make sense. You know, because the reason for objection needs to be something like it's not within the purview of the organization, you know, it's a political thing and we're a 501c3. Uh, there has to be a, a logical reason for objecting other than I don't like this motion and so I don't think we ought to talk about it. You know, that's what you do in negative debate. That's why you speak against the main motion is to express the fact that you think, or the opinion, that you think the motion should be defeated. Yeah? There is um, a situation that sometimes does arise. You know you're going to get the... Uh, 33 counties, let me search for a better word. Um, the hammer dropped on you. Uh, let's just say you have somebody that's very close to you in the assembly and you ask for a favor. And you go, this is going to come up and I'm going to get hung out to dry. It has happened and will continue to happen as long as man walks the face of the earth that for an improper purpose an objection is raised. If that objection is properly raised, you won't get to the business of hanging your fellow member at the time. And okay, I'm losing that. track of what the main motion is here. If your main motion says, I move to impeach XY, Mr. XYZ. Okay. And before that gets on the floor and they begin debate, if you know that chances are good that they'll impeach your good friend, what would you do to save your friend? Well, it's an improper use of the objection, but it has happened repeatedly. I would object to the consideration. Okay, is there, and let me ask the group, is there anything that would work better if that's your purpose, to save your friend from impeachment, what would work better than objecting to consideration? Laying it on the table, is there? Okay, tabling it. That's, that's a lot more complicated, though, I think. The no, it's not. it isn't. And let's think about why, and, there's, and we'll come back to the why. Is there anything else that you think of? Okay, there are two motions. Maybe, but... If, no, if the, if not the committee is still going to be against your guy, they're going to hang him anyway. No, I'm not opting for refer to committee. Postpone it indefinitely. Okay, that's the other good one. Now, let's talk about why. Object to consideration takes a two-thirds vote in order to be adopted. So two-thirds of the people have to agree with you that your friend should not be impeached. But if you can pull off a majority, it's this table, mm -hmm. to put it on the table, this is not debatable. I move to table it. And if you've got a majority, whoosh, it left. Now, um, if you've got a narrow majority, then as soon as the population changes, they can, somebody can move to take it from the table, and here we go again. If you move to postpone it indefinitely, all you need is a majority. Mm -hmm. And when it's gone indefinitely, then it's going to have to come back up as new business and a new in a different meeting. Thank you. You've taught me yet more creative ways to yeah, but, th but this one besides my politicals. Yeah, but this one works if you don't have two thirds. Okay, table or indefinitely, you can pull off if you're carrying majority power. But object to consideration will take two thirds. Okay. Oh, do we did I put a point of information up there already? Okay, I brought two of those. We don't need this one. Yay, you say, one less to learn. Okay. Lego lessons. <laughs>
I know, but it's more fun when we start mixing them all up instead of just defining them. Okay, this one is request for a privilege. Gets a little confusing sometime because it's a first cousin to this yellow one over here, uh, call for a question of privilege or raise a question. There, one more. Okay, thanks, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> gotta get these cues right. Okay, this one and that one, kind of often the chair has to draw the line, but the sense of it is this request for a privilege is something like I have a letter here from one of our charter members, you know, Madam Chairman, you get recognized. Madam Chairman, I have a letter here from one of our charter members and I request the permission of the assembly to share this letter with them. And, you know, if we're not in the middle of something else, okay, I would probably grant that. But I might say, uh, thank you for letting us know that, but the, the chair is going to deny that request right now because we still have eight agenda items that we need to cover in the next 30 minutes. And if you didn't like that, then what would you do? Yeah, you would appeal. Anytime you don't like the ruling by the chair, you appeal. Good. So this level of request is more personal. It's, it's lower level priority. Uh, it's something you'd like to do. Um, it might be something like I have an announcement here from Organization X, you know, not our organization, but I have an announcement here of some activities from a related group. I'd like to make this as an announcement. Yeah. And so that's a request for a personal privilege. But the one over here is a higher level privilege that affects more of the members, like sunlight, close the curtains, adjust the air conditioning, get people to use the microphones, make the people stop smoking in the no smoking room, those kinds of things. So this one is more important, more urgent, and so forth. Okay, then the last one we're going to deal with today is suspend the rules. Now you, you know if you've been through your tented pages uh, in Robert that uh, you have a whole section in there of variations on a theme. Uh, you know, 84 different motions in here and many of those overlap in one way or another but we'll be dealing probably with 35 or 40 of those but anyway suspend the rules is the motion that you use uh, you to you can suspend your standing rules uh, you can suspend anything that your bylaws say can be suspended sometimes people put their order of business in the bylaws. I don't recommend that, but there are some groups that choose to do that, and I can't even tell you why. Uh, but then there may be a note at the end or at the end of that section that says, uh, by a two-thirds vote, this order of business may be altered. Often, some group, not often, but sometimes in standing rules, groups have um, uh, rules of protocol. The flag will be carried to the front of the room this way. The honor guard will do thus and so. We'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, uh, maybe you also sing the National Anthem of Canada because you have Canadian members and it might be that on this given occasion no one from Canada is present and so someone wants to move to suspend the rule uh, uh, presenting the Canadian flag and singing the Canadian anthem or something. You know, but anyway, suspend the rules refers to rules that say they can be suspended. Normally you cannot suspend your bylaws, you cannot suspend the rules and the parliamentary authority. I mean, just think of the chaos that you could create if the rules permitted that to be done. Uh, if we said, well, for today's meeting, 
let's suspend the rule that says adjourn has higher priority than recess. And so we switched those blocks and with a motion to adjourn on the floor, someone can move to recess. And if the motion to recess was on the floor, nobody could move to adjourn. You know, that makes absolutely no sense. Okay, the other thing that sometimes gets suspended is the order of business. You know, when are the agenda, either one. Uh, you, may, you may suspend or modify the order of business to uh, move that committee reports be taken up after new business, depending on what the issues for the day are. Or that officer reports be given later in the meeting. Or you could move to uh, suspend the rules and modify the agenda so that maybe I distributed an agenda to you that has 15 items on it. And down here in slot 10 and 12, there are a couple of things that are really important to you. And so you move to modify the agenda and move those up to positions 3 and 4 and renumber the remaining items. So that's the kind of thing that can be done with a motion to suspend the rules. Okay, any question about these? Okay, uh, let's go back then and start looking at other things like uh, are they debatable, are they amendable, uh, when they can interrupt people, uh, just some of the other characteristics of the motions. And let's move our green ones for right now and go back to these ranking motions because they're the ones that you're going to use the most. Okay, let's think first of all about the vote that's required. Out of these 13 ranking motions, which ones require a majority? and which ones require a two-thirds? And why do they require what they require? Okay, we said in our first discussion that we want the, rule, we want the majority to rule, but we want the rights of the minority to be protected, preserved. Which motions here directly affect the right of the minority to be heard? Michael? <laughs> well, don't put your hand up if you don't want to answer. Uh -huh. uh, okay, help him out. Uh, I was going to say debate definitely helps, but... Okay, modifying debate, because if you put limits on debate, where Robert gives you 10 minutes per speaker, uh, if you put a two-minute limit, on each person's right to speak, you significantly curtail. Good guess, yes. You amend. Sign no, amend. <clears throat> no. Because, but debate. We're, we're talking about what affects the right of the minority to be heard. Let's just say the minority has something that they want added on. I mean, that's what an amendment's all about. Normally, the majority. Well, but but then you could say, well, the minority. You could apply that logic to the main motion. The minority doesn't like the main motion, therefore it should only, it should take a two-thirds vote to adopt it in case the minority doesn't like it. So we want, we want majority down here because we want the majority to rule. We're just talking about the right of the minority to be heard. Okay, previous question. Those are the only two in this stack that require a two-thirds vote. Limit debate restricts the amount of time. Limit debate restricts the amount of time that is available to the minority to be heard. And move the previous question, which is the same thing as vote immediately, or vote now, or close debate. You hear it called different things in different places. 
that shuts off debate completely. So those two require a two-thirds vote. But if one-third plus one of the people want to keep debate open, then it continues. Now one of the worst common errors that I seem to be around is the, is the misuse of the motion to move the previous question or to close debate or to vote immediately. Sturgis calls it vote immediately. And somebody calls it closed debate. Can't think who right now. Maybe it's just the public. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you get in situations where there's been a discussion going on and people are getting annoyed and there's a, there are some at least when you don't know whether it's two or 200. Well, you probably know if it was 200. But anyway, some people are getting annoyed and they want to vote. And so from the corner of the room or the front row or wherever, you hear somebody go, question! And somebody else goes, question! And the unwise presiding, and sometimes only one voice, and the presiding officer almost looks startled, like, oh my goodness, I heard the word question, and says, the question has been called for, you're now voting on, da-da-da, states the question and puts it to a vote. Have you ever seen that happen? Some of you haven't been out there in the bloodbath of meeting reality yet. Uh, Michael? What we simply do is, it in, in, and this was right out of Robert, so I'm going to really go back and I'm going to do some serious inquiry and report back to you next Tuesday, is when we moved to the previous question, once it was seconded, that was it. No two-thirds, no nothing. We were ready to vote. Period. The end. On the main motion? Yeah. You didn't vote on previous question? No. Someone moved to the previous question. It was seconded. We're on our way. We're voting, folks. Okay. The that, closed. That's it. Time now, to if nobody raised a point of order, then, you know, you've kind of got general consent. Yeah, we were rocking. I mean, if, if somebody, once we got done back and forth and, and, and the debate and everybody laid out their terms and laid out their biases and what, why they don't think it should pass. And then finally, the only way to get the darn thing was done was to quickly move to the previous question. Somebody else would jump up and second it. We were voting. Okay, and that's wrong. It's flatly out of order. Good, I'll wait What's till I see the next set of minutes and then go ahead and invalidate it all if we don't like it. No, because the interest, I don't know where I put point of order. It's over here in the stack. A point of order has to be raised at the time the infraction occurs. Sounds like a trial court. If you don't, okay. if you don't object, you waive the right yeah, to Yeah, and deal. if you're not on top, from now on, you'll know. You know. But if you're not on top of it enough to raise the point of order at the time it occurs, now sometimes, and this is, is less likely, sometimes you don't know whether it's really out of order. And so what you would say is, I reserve a point of order. Madam Chairman, I reserve a point of order saying, I think this is out of order. I'm going to have to go get my big book and check it, you know, if nobody in the group comes to your aid. But you're saying, I think this is out of order, and if it is, then it will be invoked retroactively. But that doesn't happen very often. Uh, so what you need to do is raise the point of order at the time it occurs. But when previous question, when you want to close debate, someone should say, I move, unless, it, if everyone's quiet, then as presiding officer, I'm going to say, is there any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, the chair assumes that you are ready for the question to be put to the assembly. Okay, the, chair, the question before the assembly is, da, 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 da. All those in favor say aye, but I let you know that I'm getting ready to put it to a vote. And if you don't say anything, then that's your general consent that, yes, I'm ready for it to go to a vote. And, and this is kind of your last chance warning, you know. Hearing no further discussion, uh, we're about to put the motion to a vote before the assembly. So if you have something to say, raise your hand, stand up get identified because we're about to close this out. So often that's the way debate ends and that's okay. But if someone says, I move the previous question, second, then I should say, no. I should say, it's been moved and seconded to order the previous question. 
This motion requires a two-thirds vote, unless I know my people are trained and remember that. Uh, but it's a good idea to remind any group that doesn't keep all this straight yet. Requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. You know, uh, if, and then you announce the result of the vote. If it's two-thirds in the affirmative, the, then you, the language is, the previous question has been ordered. We are now voting on, and you restate the main motion. The main motion was amended. You know, we're now voting on the main motion as amended, which reads, and you restate it exactly the way the people are to vote on it. And there should be a direct match between what goes in the minutes and what the chair said, which is why in many large groups uh, they use uh, no carbon paper, you know, NCR paper, and get three copies of that motion right when it's made the first time. And someone may stand up and, and move the motion, and the chair will say, we need that in writing as quickly as you can bring it to us. And you may, if it's a long motion, you know, you may stop and wait until the person gets that all written out and signs it. Maker of the motion peels off one copy, secretary gets a copy, presiding officer gets a copy, then we're all working from the same words. Because what goes in the minutes is what goes in the legal record, and that's what got adopted. Unless you've got a tape recording of the meeting, and you can show that the tape shows that the secretary made an error. You know, are there a sufficient number of members to amend the minutes uh, because the secretary got it down wrong? But it is totally inappropriate when somebody goes, question, to say the question is, or question, you know, whatever character is bellowing, which is usually the case. Uh, but because one person is put out and ready to vote uh, doesn't mean that they bring the whole meeting to a screeching halt and you have to do what they just tried to order you to do. Now sometimes what I will do if I'm chairing the meeting and some, hmm? Cheering the meeting or chairing? Chairing, okay. chairing. I lived around Chicago for a while. Okay, if I'm chairing the meeting and I hear a couple of, three or four people calling out question, then I may say, is there further discussion, and not seeing anybody seeking it, then uh, I might say something like, the chair has heard several calls for question, I'm going to interpret that as a motion and a second to close debate. All those in favor of closing debate, but that's a way of saying, you folks are really out of line, you know, you're procedure was out of order in the way that you approach this, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt here and at least put the motion to close debate before the assembly. Okay, any questions here? Okay, what else might take a two-thirds vote? We can run these others back out here. Here are the red ones. Take a look at those for a minute. I don't think there are any incidental motions that take a two-thirds. Let me check my own notes. Well, object to consideration. We've talked about that one. Okay, so the only... The only incidental motion that takes a two-thirds vote is object to consideration. Now, why would that be the only one? The only incidental motion that, requi that requires a two-thirds vote. Basically cutting off the right of people to be heard. I mean, there may be more people that want to get this thing uh, well discussed. So unless you've got two-thirds, you're pretty well laying the hammer on a bunch of people that may have a pretty good idea and you're being... Overbearing, to say the least. Okay, you're affecting the right of the minority to be heard on this particular issue. And that's the guiding rule of thumb on two-thirds vote. Okay, many of these other incidental motions don't even require a vote. And, well, 
I guess my, actually that was an overgeneralization. Um, they, most of them take a majority vote. A point of order takes no vote. Okay, there's one other that usually takes a two-thirds vote, and that's the motion to suspend the rules. I had to stop and think about it because we don't use it very often either. Okay, but changing the rules affects the minority as well. So that one takes a two-thirds. Okay, are there any of these restoratory motions that take a two-thirds? Hmm? Okay, let me read them to Oh, that's the resolution. That's like a main motion. I'd say it would uh, rescind. Okay, rescind because? Pretty strong medicine. You're asking uh, the group as a whole to rescind whatever it was that doctor Okay, you're reversing made. a decision that was previously made. Okay, two-thirds commit, uh, I can say this, discharge a committee, amend something previously adopted, both of those are bringing back an old issue and asking the assembly to reverse the decision. Rescind is going back and reversing something that was passed before. And you're doing it. Reconsider is just a majority because that's the same, I'm waving the blocks around here. Reconsider is at the same meeting. Okay, we may change our mind 30 minutes later and say, oh, no, I don't, we don't want to do it that way. And then we go back and reconsider the motion to reconsider. So forth. But at the same meeting, we can change our mind several ways. So that's okay. Still a majority vote. Take from the table, majority or two-thirds? Okay, majority. Yeah, we just we laid something on the table until we're ready to get to it. Now we're ready to get to it. Took a majority to put it over there. Takes a majority to bring it back. Okay, so that one's no big deal. Mm -hmm. You say discharge committee was two thirds mm -hmm. also? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because forming the committee was a majority. And now you're undoing something that you did. So you're reversing a previous decision. Okay. What would you do if you needed to reverse something that was in ink? Yeah. And what would you do in your minutes? You're not supposed to know this yet. I'm just... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how would you strike it? But would you have to m m have a motion to strike something from the minutes or move to strike mm -hmm. the minutes? I'm okay. not sure exactly what you would use to do that. Okay, let's think about that one for a minute. Uh, if, for example, we endorsed a political candidate last month, and we got out and started getting our act together to do this. And then the poor creature lands in jail for some really serious major thing. <laughs> you know, whatever. And so at this month's meeting, and, and maybe we passed a resolution last month that says this organization unanimously endorses candidate X for the position of mayor or city council, whatever it is. And then by the, a month later, we discover, oh, gee, that was a really poor decision. Yes? That happened uh, in the last election. Uh, you know that little old... Okay, don't call any names in here. AJF, it happened in the last election. Okay. The AJF, a certain candidate was running for the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, and he claimed he had extensive criminal experience, that he had tried criminal cases, and that he was just a mm -hmm. cat's meow. And as it turned out, the only criminal case he ever tried was actually a parking ticket to a jury. And he worked in-house counsel for an insurance company. When the party that he was with found out about it, as well as all the other right-wing organizations, they immediately struck 
from their endorsements all reference that he ever existed uh, and everything else that went along with the endorsements. And the party didn't invite him to the, he was the only public official that won election. He won election, by the way, because the public didn't get the, no, the news soon enough. Um, he was not invited to the governor's ball that night when the governor was sworn in. So cleaning that up was quite a little mess for a lot of, a lot of political organizations. Okay, but now when you clean this up, when we're talking about the minutes and the legal record of your organization. So at this next meeting, then we come in and somebody says, I move that we rescind move to strike it. our endorsement of candidate X. And we discuss all this and we agree, two thirds plus, that that was a bad decision and we want to undo it. Now what are we gonna do to our minutes? Well, are we gonna take white out to them? Oh, let me get I, I don't, some. I don't think you can legally or ethically do anything to your minutes except put a line through it. Is that okay? Right? Yeah. What do you want to add, Mike? What you do is in your new minutes you reflect that the uh, the endorsement has been withdrawn or the paragraph preceding and that one was stricken, but you don't ever alter an official record. It's just like anything else. If it says stricken, it's still subject to ever being reviewed. And if, okay, you, okay. if you were to take it away, but you're both right. Nobody could review it. I mean, he put a line through it, but you could still read it. To the right. point where if it had to be reviewed, if it came up in a courtroom, the court right. can't review something that isn't there. Right. And that's the important point that we're getting to here. And usually the process is to draw one line through it and then over in the margin make a note that in the old minutes that says rescinded such and such date. Then if you want to look to the minutes of October the 24th, 1995, or 99 or 62 or whatever it is, you can go through all these files and look at those minutes and see what happened on that date that they would go back and rescind something. But you don't go back and delete it because then these more recent minutes would have a statement that we rescinded the resolution of April the 12th, 1982, 1993, whatever. And we go back to April 12, 1992, and we discover there's a big whiteout blotch in the middle of the minutes. You know, and then, then we've altered the legal record of what took place back then. So the way you account for that in the minutes is to draw a line through it and mark it rescinded with the date and initial it. I don't know if this is in Roberts, but this is just common sense because Roberts is supposed to keep uh, records just like any other organization. If you alter that document, it's void. Period. I don't care what part of it you want to use later on. It is no longer an official minute because you've tampered with the official minute. So if people were to do uh, court would have to deal with that one to decide whether it's the best available document given the available documents. Uh, now, one of the ways you... Well, have, the exhibit like, ain't coming in if it's got alterations on it. Yeah, well, this is a court thing that mm -hmm. the judge or whoever would have to rule on how much of it would be admissible and so forth. But one of the ways that you help guarantee that your documents are admissible and that you avoid tampering. And this would happen when you have minutes that are of a highly important controversial nature. You've got sums of money in there, uh, uh, granting of grants or just things that usually money is the really crucial part, but there are other issues you could imagine. You go through and the president and the secretary and sometimes a third person in fresh ink initials or signs every page. And, there, and on those pages, there can be no corrections, no whiteouts. You know, you glitch something up, you have to run a new page through the laser printer and initial it. Mm -hmm. To do something, and it, and it worked pretty well in our organization, at the end of every meeting when the minutes were adopted, the secretary, we had a seal made up, a metal seal that went over the paper and it said the following phrase, true copy I certify and attest, the original never left the safe. If somebody needed it, they would request a copy, we would give them what we call a certified copy. The yeah, it's kind of like your transcripts right, the, the university. The secretary of the organization would certify by her seal and signature or his seal and signature that what you had was identical to what was in our safe but the right. original ain't leaving the safe. Right. Well, we're running out of time, but one of the things that you, you know in your transcripts, if you make a photocopy, all of a sudden the word copy jumps off the page. There are a number of ways to preserve your documents and guarantee that they are originals, and if you need to know more about that, we can certainly discuss it. 
Okay, more on motions next time. We'll start scrambling them up.